All right, it's the end of the week here on the Morning Pit on YouTube.com slash PantherLaracom. I'm glad it's Friday. You're glad it's Friday. We're all looking forward to the weekend. And tomorrow's game, Pitt at Florida State, and we'll get you ready for it right here on the Morning Pit on YouTube.com slash PantherLaracom. Like this video and subscribe. You know the deal. Like button is down there. The subscribe button's right down here, right over that yellow.com logo. This little blue rectangle. Click that thing so you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. I really appreciate it. And of course, if you want to make sure you never miss any of our exclusive pit video content here at youtube.com slash pantheleracom, once you subscribe, you can turn on notifications and get an alert sent right to your phone every time we post new videos, either the morning pit video that we put out every Monday, every morning, Monday through Friday, post-game press conference videos like we did after the uh, Jeff Cable press conference on Tuesday night with the Diaz Graham twins, which was great. Or Kenny Payne, the Louisville coach, when he talked about how Pitt was the best team in the ACC. Yeah, you probably wanted to check that one out. And certainly, if you uh, turn on notifications, if you subscribe to our YouTube channel and then turn on the notifications, you can get alerts sent to your phone whenever we do that. And of course, when we go live for our live Panther Lair show every Wednesday night at 8 30 p.m. right here at youtube.com slash Panther you want to make sure you don't miss those because that's always a good time um, you'll get a notification if you have those turned on so you should do it like this video subscribe to the channel and then turn on notifications or yours if you are so inclined of course in the meantime when you're not here on youtube.com slash Panther you should be spending your time at panther-lair.com the main website the mothership Panther-Lair.com, Pittsburgh.Rivals.com. It's the most comprehensive source of Pitt sports news on the internet, football, basketball, and recruiting coverage all there at PantherLair.com and message boards where you can interact with hundreds and thousands of other Pitt fans all day, every day. Panther-Lair.com. Lots of conversation on the boards this week. Certainly a lot of conversation on the boards since Tuesday night. And it's really ramping up today in advance of tomorrow's game at Florida State. Uh, Pitt looking to avenge the loss to the Seminoles from, what day was that? January 21st, so a few weeks ago on that one. And they'll get their chance at noon tomorrow in Tallahassee. Florida State, not a team that... Um, not a team that should be able to beat Pitt. I, I mean, like I come right out and say it. Just be completely honest about it. They're eight and seventeen overall this season, six and eight in the conference after losing to Syracuse on Wednesday night. And, and the reality is, Pitt shouldn't have lost that game at the Peterson Event Center last month, and they shouldn't lose this game tomorrow um, at Florida State. Pitt, you know, Pitt I think has positioned itself in the conference, uh, you know, as such that it should be able to beat. Florida State, just like they did against Louisville, just like they did against Georgia Tech, just like they should do when they face Boston College next week, just like they should do against Notre Dame. They should be able to take care of business against these teams. I think that's where the expectation is right now. It shouldn't be a hope. It should be an expectation. You shouldn't be like, wow, you know, hope they can take care of business. Hope they can just beat those teams at the bottom. No, they should expect to beat the teams at the bottom of the league because they are a team at the top of the league, not just in the rankings, but in their performance and in their roster. They are one of the best teams in the ACC. They should be angling for, uh, you know, a Thursday appearance in the ACC tournament, a double buy into the ACC tournament. They should be angling for a top seven, top six, top five seed in the NCAA tournament. This is the path they have put themselves on. And to continue to stay on that path, they have to take care of games like this. Just like they did on Tuesday night against Louisville. Go out there and kick the ever-loving crap out of them. That That's what you should do. I don't know what you know Pitt was. I, well, I do know what Pitt was last year. I don't know what they're going to be next year. None of that matters. What matters is that right now, in the 2023-2022-2023 season, Pitt is certifiably one of the best teams in the conference. Top three, top four, top two, top one, somewhere around there. And they should play like it. And they have been playing like it. You know what I mean? When they're able to take care of business at North Carolina, they're able to beat Miami. Um... You know, they were able to beat Virginia. They've had slip-ups along the way. They have three losses in conference play. One of those at Duke. Another against the team that's been at the top of the conference through the first half of the ACC slate. And then this huge blemish of a Florida State game. At home, no less. You can't allow that to happen again. 
And and I don't know, you know, I was uh, looking at a thread from yesterday about whether the game is must win or this or that. I, I don't know if it's must win in terms of NCAA tournament chances. I think they position themselves quite well. And even if they somehow decide or find a way to blow it tomorrow, they're still going to have six more opportunities after that. And, and there's no reason they can't win five out of the final six after um, tomorrow's game. So, I mean, even if they, they lose tomorrow and fall to 17 and 8 overall, 10 and 4, they could still win another five games, finish with 22 regular season wins overall, 15 and 5 record in the ACC, um, you know, which will probably get them a double bye in the ACC tournament. And, you know, hell, it might win the conference. You know, I, I don't necessarily think 15 and 5 is automatically out of the running for the regular season title. And so, I don't know if tomorrow's game is a must win in terms of making the NCAA tournament. It'll have a big effect. If they lose, it will have a big impact on what their seed would end up being. Um, I don't know if it's a must win in terms of the NCAA tournament. It's a must win in terms of continuing to assert themselves as one of the best teams in this conference, which is how they played through the first 13 games of conference play. They played like one of the best teams in the conference. They've been one of the best teams in the conference. They are one of the best teams in the conference and they need to act like it just like they did on Tuesday night. You might not go to Florida State and get a 34-point win on the road, like you got at home, but you know I'm not necessarily counting out Pitt's chances of putting on a real display. This team has been remarkably good on the road this season. They have a 6-2 record. One of those losses was at Vanderbilt. One of those wins was at Northwestern. In ACC play, they're 5-1 on the road. The only game they've lost on the road was that Duke game. But they beat Carolina on the road. They beat Syracuse on the road. They've gone on the road and taken care of business. So I'm not concerned about this team being on the road tomorrow and saying, wow, that, that's going to be an even more dangerous one because it's on the road. Florida State's crowds are fine, not great. After losing Wednesday night, I, I think they're probably going to be even worse. Uh, you know, They had a chance to string a couple wins together heading into this game after they beat Louisville last week. They could have beat Syracuse on uh, Wednesday night. And, and come in on a two-game winning streak heading into the pit game. Um, instead, they're coming off a loss to the Orange. And, you know, I, I think they're averaging like 7,000 fans per ACC home game. It's an arena that holds less than 12,000. So, I mean, 7,000 in a, you know, an arena that holds 11,500 is going to be a decent crowd. But I don't know how many of them are going to show up for a team that continues to slide the way Florida State has this season. I'm not concerned about being on the road. Quite frankly, there are two things, and I said this on either on the morning pit or on the live show on Wednesday night, or probably both, because there's only so much content to go around. Um, there's there's two things that concern me with any team that Pitt faces, whether it's the ACC regular season, the ACC tournament, or the NCAA tournament. There's two things that concern me: one, three point defense; two, rebounding, offensive rebounding, in particular, offensive rebounding. Because teams that can offensive rebound well, you know, Pitt gives up a lot of offensive rebounds to teams that don't off, you know, do well on the offensive glass. Teams that do well on the offensive glass or have done well all season really can feast against Pitt. It's it's just sort of uh, th there are a lot of factors that go into it, I think, but it's just one of the truths of this team. And if you can defend the three well, you're gonna, you know, you can limit and maybe even somewhat neutralize. Arguably Pitt's best, biggest offensive weapons. Uh, and, and not necessarily in terms of players. I'm not saying, boy, if you can stop Greg Elliott or you can stop Greg Blake Hinson. But shooting the three is such a big part of this team's offense and such a big part of this team's success that if you can limit that, if you can neutralize it a little bit or make it difficult for them to get the shots they want to get from outside, you're going to have a really good chance. Florida State is 15th. In the ACC, in three-point field goal percentage defense in conference games this season, the whole season they're 14th or no, they're uh, yeah 14th in the ACC in three-point field goal percentage defense. They are quite frankly one of the worst teams in the conference at get at defending the three. Simple as that. Offensive rebounds, they're 11th. In offensive rebounds per game in ACC games. 10th in offensive rebound percentage in ACC games. Better than worst. Better than Pitt. Pitt is 13th in uh, defensive rebound percentage. So, I mean, like I say, Pitt has been vulnerable to teams that can offensive rebound. 
Florida State will probably get a bunch. They'll probably get 8, 9, 10 offensive rebounds against Pitt, maybe 11. But they're not going to be able to feast as much as some of the better teams in the conference at offensive rebounding. Florida State's not a great three-point percentage defense team, and they're not a great offensive rebounding team. Those are the two, I think, ways you can beat Pitt to the you know biggest sort of box score stat line indicators of whether Pitt might lose to a team. And Florida State doesn't really excel at either one. Where they excelled at the Peterson Event Center, as we all know, is they went 10 of 20 from three, which was easily, by several percentage points, their best three-point percentage, three-point shooting performance in an ACC game this season for Florida State. 10 of 20 from three. They've had three games out of 14. They've played 14 ACC games, Florida State has. Three of those, they've made double-digit three-pointers. They hit 10 of 25 against Georgia Tech earlier this year. They hit 10 of 20 against Pitt. And then a couple weeks ago, they shot 13 of 30 against Clemson. They lost that game, 82-81. But I mean, you take the number one team, you know, the top team in the conference, and you lose by one, 82-81, you gave a pretty valiant effort. You could see the value of shooting 13 of 30. Those are also the only three games in ACC play this season where Florida State has shot over 40% from three. Every other game, they're... 3 of 10, 3 of 22, 7 of 18, 5 of 19. They're under 40% in all these games, except for those three, Clemson, Georgia Tech, and Pitt. Now, if they shoot over 40% against Pitt again, Pitt might lose. Odds are, they won't, since they've only done it three times in 14 games. 12 out of their 14 games, they've they've, so they've tried to shoot a lot of three-pointers. 12 out of their 14 ACC games this season, uh, Florida State has attempted at least eight threes. So so they've tried to put up, or excuse me, (laughs) attempted at least 18 threes in 12 out of their 14 conference games so far. So they've tried to shoot a lot. But they average just seven made three-point field goals per game in ACC games so far this season. They're... They shoot a lot. They try to shoot a lot. They they want to find those openings. And if Pitt's perimeter defense is lacking, if Pitt's perimeter defense is not getting there, they might have a chance to knock some of those shots down. They're probably going to take a lot of them. Against Syracuse, they attempted 35, but they only made 9. The Louisville game before that, the one they won, they attempted 23. They only made 8. NC State, they were 3 of 10 from three. I mean, the list goes on and on. When they lost to Miami, they attempted 22 three-pointers and only made three of them. So they're a team that will shoot a lot, but they're not going to make very many of them. That's why they're uh, ninth in the conference in three-point field goal percentage shooting um, in ACC games. They're not a great three-point shooting team. They got hot against Pitt. They got hot against Georgia Tech. They got hot against Clemson. They had three games out of 14 where they got hot. This is a game Pitt should win. Win fairly comfortably. And, and you know, just as much, and I, I said this a lot about the Louisville game, that, you know, Pitt had won these close games against Wake Forest and Miami and, uh, um, you know, North Carolina, these, these one-point games, final possession games, which says a lot about them, about their resilience and their fortitude and how they're able to hold up at the end and make plays to win games at the end. But it also says a lot about them that they were able to go out and kick the pants off of Louisville. You know what I mean? Just absolutely kick their teeth in and, you know, beat them by a lot. You know, more than 30 points. It says a lot about a team that's able to do that. And they need to be able to take care of business in that way in this game tomorrow. And and quite frankly, I think they will. I haven't made my pick yet for our staff picks, but I'm going to pick them to win by a decent amount. I think they go on the road and, and, and do it. You know, maybe Blake Hinson there, although he's got some pretty... Pretty wicked uh, home road splits. Maybe Blake Hinson gets a little bit back on track. Maybe Nate Santos knocks a few down. Greg Elliott, I think, is reliable. Nellie Cummings should have a big game. Jamarius Burton should be Jamarius Burton. And we'll see if the continuing evolution of Pitt's front court, well, continues. All right, some other things um, didn't talk about too much. I I wanted to, um, just before we get out of the week, uh, because this was brought up or or this kind of came out this week, uh, on the, the football front about Pitt having six players invited to the NFL draft combine. And I, I don't think I talked about this on a morning Pitt earlier this week. Um, 
but I thought we could touch on it a little bit here. Six guys, uh, offense, Israel Banacanda and Carter Warren. Defense, Kalaja Kansi, Haba Baldonado, Brandon Hill, and Servasia Dennis. Those six guys invited to the Combine. Obviously, Pitt's got more players going to the NFL or trying to go to the NFL um, who weren't invited. But, you know, the Combine's not the end-all, be-all. Obviously, Pitt will have Pro Day in the spring. That's usually in March. And a lot of NFL scouts will get a chance to see the Pitt players in person, you know, go through all the drills and the testing and all of those things. As far as the Combine goes... Um, not too surprised. I, I kind of thought Eric Hallett would get invited. I, I'm a little surprised that he didn't get an invite to the combine. Um, but I'm not too surprised about the guys they picked. I think it's interesting to see uh, Carter Warren make the list. I, you know, throughout the season, as we look at different draft, uh, you know, uh, prognostications and draft predictions, and the, the write up on this guy, the write up on that guy. I, I don't feel like Pitt's offensive linemen, you know, the the seniors, you know, like a Carter Warren, Marcus Minor, Gabe Hoy, Owen Drexel. I don't think there was ever really much talk about them. I don't think they got brought up very much on the different draft preview websites or, or draft prospects to watch that kind of thing. I, I don't feel like those guys got mentioned. Now Warren missed most of the season due to injury. But it's interesting that he ended up getting invited. I'm not surprised Izzy Abanacanda got invited. He was one of the best running backs in college football this past season. Um, and, and I'm really interested to see how he does at the draft. I mean, you know, I, I want to see what Izzy's 40 is. You know, we, we might, maybe we'll have a poll on the message boards or on Twitter or somewhere of, you know, you know does he go under 4-4? Does he go, you know, 4-5, 4-3? You know, where, where does he end up? I think he's got a lot of speed. So maybe just to see where he measures in at weight wise you know because he's i wouldn't call him a small back you know i think he's got good height and and he's built pretty solid he's thicker than like a guy like Lashawn mccoy Lashawn might have been a little bit taller than izzy um i i think sort of anecdotally remembering uh but he you know izzy abanican is built you know he's thick he's got those big you know he's got big tree trunk legs i mean he's a solidly put together guy i'm really curious to see how he translates that weight into his speed or how the two kind of stack up of a guy his size um, and then the speed that he's able to put out there. I think he's going to run really well. Now, a lot of that, as we know, is going to come down to how well he trained this offseason. You know, he obviously declared for the NFL draft, didn't go to the Sun Bowl. And so you would like to think that he spent all of December, all of January, and, and now training. And, and not just training but specifically training how to run the 40 so so much of that really is a a technique um and and some of the guys who make a big jump with their 40 i think spend a lot of time working not just on their natural speed and acceleration but on their technique getting the right jump how to run through a 40 i, I think there is something to that as someone who has attended you know high school prospect camps for 15 years I've watched a lot of guys run the 40 and you can tell which guys have practiced it and worked on it and had a coach work with them and, and worked on the technique and which guys haven't. Usually it's the linemen who have not because who cares what a lineman's 40 is? Um, you know, I, uh, so, you know, if Izzy has worked on that stuff, I think he can put up a pretty eye popping time and, and move himself pretty high in the conversation of the top backs in this class in addition to the work that he would do in the other drills pass catching drills and the, the three cone and vertical and all that stuff so those guys will be interesting uh you know hopefully Kalaja Kansi is available I, I haven't seen anything officially from Kalaja Kansi about his availability for the draft but hopefully he's healed up and able to participate um you'd like to see him be able to put up a, a you know, you look at the model of, you know, as being Aaron Donald, who really just dominated at the combine, put up really impressive numbers and was able to, um, you know, I think build his draft stock by running as well as he did in the 40 and the ver all the things that he did that showed that, holy cow, this dude is not only super productive on the field, but he's a freak athlete as well. And Kalaja Kansi, who's smaller than Aaron Donald, I think he's going to have to put up even more impressive numbers or try to put up as impressive numbers as Aaron Donald did to, to work himself up in that conversation. Now, if he's got that work ethic, if he's got that commitment, he, he can do it. You know, I think you, you have sort of um, two sort of, you know, two examples ahead of you where Aaron Donald did it a certain way and performed a certain way. And, 
you know, quite frankly, Jalen Twyman, who sat out the 2020 season, doesn't seem it, it doesn't seem like he put up or put in the kind of work that a guy like Aaron Donald did. Uh, you know, and so he didn't test well, and so he didn't maybe get the opportunity that Aaron Donald ended up with, and the opportunity that Kalaji Kansi could get, depending on how he tested. Hoppe Baldonado, interested to see what he does as well, you know, in the, in the measurements and things like that. He had a really good, I think he was at the Senior Bowl. I still forgot to check which one that was. It's hard to keep track of all these things. But, you know, he's a guy, he's gotten a lot of good off-season pub. And the combine will be a chance for him to really impress, uh, you know, with his size and athleticism and just how well he moves for a guy his size. And Brandon Hill will, will be another one that I, I think, you know, Hopefully, he his model should be a guy like Jason Pinnock. Because Pinnock, when he went to the draft, worked really hard in the offseason. DeMar Hamlin, too, is another great example of a guy who really put in the work after his pit career ended. You know, between the end of the season and the combine, worked like crazy. So he could, I don't even know if DeMar Hamlin went to the combine. He might have just gone to uh, Pitt's Pro Day. And same thing with Jason Pinnock. And just lit it up and, and put up big numbers, impressive numbers, uh, you know, that maybe got some uh, NFL coaches and scouts to take a second look at the tape and say, wait, this guy might be a little bit better than we thought. Uh, you know, so that's what Brandon Hill, he needs to follow that model of, of working like those guys did between the end of the season and the combine so that he can go and test really well. And I think he's going to put up a pretty good 40. You know, I, I I don't know what's typical for a safety. I don't know what would count as really good for a safety, but he should have numbers, you know, his 40 numbers and speed numbers should, uh, you know, compare favorably with, with some of the corners in the draft. I mean, quite frankly, I think that's how fast he is. And then Servasier Dennis would be the other guy. And I, I think the question with Servasier Dennis is going to be how big he can get. And I'm not sure how much bigger he can get because He's got great instincts. Uh, he's got good enough speed. He's he's really smart. He knows the game. He can he can play faster than his speed actually is because of his understanding of the game and his his instincts and his IQ. Um, but he's gonna have to get a little bigger. I I, I really think uh, you know I think he's gonna have to bulk up, and I'm not sure where the ceiling is on that. I mean, at some point you re I, I think a, you know an athlete, a guy like him, will reach a max capacity to where he can't really get any bigger. And so uh, I'm interested to see with him, maybe as much as anything, what his weight is when he gets to the combine because he's going to need to add some good weight, some muscle. And then, you know, I, I, he'll do well in the drills. You know what I mean? The, the actual football drills. I think he'll test okay. Um, but he'll do well in the drills because he, he, he just knows the game like that. But NFL, you know, linemen, NFL, even running backs. I mean, NFL tight end. I mean, these are big guys that he's going to be, you know, tasked with taking on and shedding and tackling and and and, and attacking. And he's going to need to be a little bit bigger, I think, to, to take on those tasks. So in the combine, there'll be plenty of pit interest with those six guys. Uh, you know, best of luck, of course, to them and all of Pitt seniors who are uh, hoping, the, hoping to enter the NFL this offseason between the Combine and then the Pro Day in, in March. We'll be keeping an eye on, on all of that. We'll talk about it for sure here on the Morning Pit and on uh, PantherLair.com. But wait, we can't end the show yet because after we tape the show, I taped it Thursday morning, Thursday afternoon, I should say. There was news. Pitt got a new commitment. Well, they got a commitment earlier in the week, a football commitment from the class of 2024, but it finally got announced yesterday on Thursday because this is how it goes. They The recruit commits to Pitt. Uh, Pat Narduzzi tweets out that they got a new commitment, and then we wait to find out who it was. And it was sort of who our guest was all along. Central Catholic defensive lineman Ty Juhas. You can see the headlines up there. Ty Juhas committing to Pitt. Uh, picked Pitt over, I think he had an offer from Eastern Michigan, not a, a loaded offer sheet, but I think, you know, there, there are a couple of things. First of all, this is a defensive tackle prospect from the Whippeal. Pitt's not going to offer him early and take him early if they're not pretty well convinced about his ability. Second of all, we're talking about a defensive lineman here. And there are a few positions on this team, uh, in recruiting and on the roster that I think we have 
sort of given the staff the benefit of the doubt about, and, and rightfully so. And defensive line is certainly one of them. I mean, we're talking about Charlie Partridge here. If Charlie Partridge wants to stand up, uh, what's the, the phrase we always use, stand on the table for a recruit, if he wants to, to go to bat for a recruit and say, we should take this guy, I think we can all defer to him a little bit. There have been, you know, they, they haven't gotten hits on everybody. They don't have a perfect batting average when it comes to defensive line recruits or def- defensive backs, but they've hit on enough of them that I think we can give them the benefit of the doubt. And look, if you're going to take a chance, and I'm not saying they're taking a chance on Ty Uhas, but he's a guy who's 6'3", 260. And you look at those two photos, I-, I don't know if you think he looks like a guy who's 260 or not, but he's also a baseball player. At least he was until he blew out his elbow over the summer. But he was a pitcher, really good pitcher. Somebody who was talking, I don't know if he had a ton of offers, but he was talking to colleges and considering the possibility of playing both baseball and and football in college. You don't see a lot of defensive tackles who are also really good pitchers. Sort of speaks to the athleticism a little bit. And as we talk about defensive tackles, and and I talked a little, you know, I talked earlier when I was talking about, uh, or I talked yesterday about the super seniors, and I talked about Devin Danielson and Tyler Bentley and David Green, how they need that playmaking defensive tackle. Maybe Elliot Donald can be that guy. Maybe Sean Fitzsimmons can be that guy. I think Ty Uhas looks like he can be one of those kinds of guys. I think he's an athletic, uh, playmaking defensive tackle, can shed double teams, get off blocks, and get in the backfield to make plays. And that's the kind of guy they need to add. They need to load up on. They need you know to, to fill in the roster with. They need those kind of playmaking defensive tackles. And it's clear that defensive tackle is an important position in this recruiting class. They have four commitments so far in the class of 2024. And two of them are defensive tackles, Ty Uhas and Jasir Whittington from Philadelphia, in addition to Jules Goff, the running back, and uh, Rick Darius Farmer, Dede Farmer from Florida, the wide receiver. Farmer and Whittington are both four-star recruits. Uhas and uh, Goff haven't been rated yet, but I'd say they're at least three-star guys with a chance to impress over the summer and next season as seniors. But another recruit for the class, four commitments so far by February 9th, really February 7th is when UHAS committed, but it'll go in the books officially as a February 9th commitment. Four commitments by February 9th is a pretty good start to this class. And, you know, we'll we'll see how, how it ends up. We'll see who ends up signing, but pretty good start, like I say, for the coaching staff and, uh, you know, to get four guys already and four guys will look like pretty good prospects. Farmer is a playmaking wide receiver. Whittington and Uhas look like playmaking defensive tackles and Goff is a really good running back prospect from York, Pennsylvania. So not a bad start to the 2024 class and, uh, you know, appreciate you taking this little interruption into the end of the show. Thought we were done, but we weren't quite done because we had to add in some stuff about Ty Uhas. And, and the last thing I'll say about him you know, so often we, you know, I think Pitt fans will talk about, you know, and they won't always say it like this, but they want guys who want to be at Pitt. They, they want to find those recruits who, when they get the offer, they just can't wait to commit. Well, this is that guy. You know, this is that guy. The rest of his offer sheet, regardless of the rest of his offer sheet, this is a guy who always wanted to go to Pitt. You know, he grew up watching Pitt. He grew up loving Pitt, and he always wanted to go to Pitt. Well, now he is. And, and I think, you know, you have to enjoy that. A local player, a local prospect, a standout at Central Catholic, and a guy who really didn't hesitate at all. Got his offer and committed three or four days later. Probably would have committed on the spot, except, you know, you're supposed to wait a few days before you uh, make the commitment. So he waits three or four days. He got the offer, I think, on Saturday. He committed on Tuesday. So he waited about four days um, and then committed. And didn't really, I, I don't think he had really much hesitation about it at all. Waited three days, I guess. Um, didn't really have much hesitation about it at all. Always knew where he wanted to go, got the opportunity, and now he's going there. So, uh, congratulations mm-hmm. to Ty Uhas on being Fit Pitt's fourth commitment in the class of 2024 and building a pretty good class so far. We'll see where it goes from here, but uh, like how this thing has started for Pitt, seems like a pretty good start to the class so we'll return you now to the regularly scheduled end of today's morning pit but we couldn't go without talking about the new commitment so make sure you stay tuned to panther-lair.com pittsburgh.rivals.com for all of that coverage and mostly and more immediately for the game tomorrow pit at florida state we'll have a full game preview for you tomorrow morning with a matchup preview and our staff picks all of us on the panther.com Staff make our predictions for the game. I think I'm currently in first place. I might be tied with Steven Gertz. I forget exactly, but I'm 
pretty far up there. So, uh, you know, follow my lead. Take what I take. I'm going to pick Pitt to win. I'm going to pick them to win by a decent amount because I think this team understands what's in front of it. I think they understand what they can achieve, and I think they understand, perhaps most importantly, what they need to do to achieve it. So keep an eye out for that on the uh, on PantherLair.com tomorrow morning, Saturday morning. And then, of course, during the game, we'll have a game thread going. You can keep up on everything going on and, co- and talk with other Pitt fans throughout the game should be uh should be a good time should be a lot of fun to have those conversations so thanks for watching the morning pit today thanks for watching it all week we appreciate it make sure you like this video and subscribe to our youtube channel youtube.com slash panther i hope you had a great week hope you have a great friday night enjoy it it's the end of the week hope you have a great weekend and we'll be back with you on monday morning for another morning pit right here youtube.com slash panther